Well, welcome everyone back from our little uh, hiatus here, and uh, we've got two weeks to catch up on. Uh, when we last left off here, we were just finishing up uh, the first Kings and uh, getting into second Kings, and uh, that just continued the, uh, the pandemonium, the craziness of what was happening on the uh, between Judah, the southern kingdom, and Israel, the northern kingdom, and how uh, their kings determined the uh, the tenor and the of of uh, what was happening. Um, as we noticed in um, Israel, the northern kingdom, it only lasts about two hundred years because. In that time, there is a lot of chaos. Uh, the quickest way to become king was to uh, be assassinate your rival. You had about 19 kings and I believe about seven different households in a 200-year period. So that does not do much to create a uh, very stable time. And there were times that uh, they got along with uh, the southern kingdom and other times they were attacking the southern kingdom. So it just depended on the king. But uh, what got them into trouble, of course, was the uh, worship of the pagan gods and uh, bringing, bringing the world and its gods in rather than bringing the living God out to the people. And so in about 722, uh, Samaria, the capital of uh, of the northern kingdom is uh, overthrown. It falls. Assyria relocates most of the people and brings in a new group of people. So hence you have the ten lost tribes of Israel and then the people that come in want to know what the local God uh, expects. And so the few people that are left tell them about this living God of Israel and uh, they develop and they look around and they adapt to um, this uh, new land and become known as the Samaritans because of uh, being named after the capital. Now the southern kingdom, um, there still is a pandemonium, but we have a few good kings that come up every once in a while. And the one thing we do have is stability being the line of David. Even though things are bad and crazy at times and kings are not good, there's something about that stability of having that promise of David's line continuing that allows the country to have a little bit uh, more stability. Also, they're a little bit more off the beaten trail, so um, they don't have quite as much of the interaction, but they do have Egypt comes up every once in a while and Assyria and tries to create a little bit of trouble. But at the end of uh, Second Kings, then we have the fall of Jerusalem, and um, that uh, then gets picked up also in the books of the Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles. But um, First and Second Chronicles almost are a breath of fresh air when you get done because they talk only about the house of David. And they uh, give us a little more detail about um, people's responsibilities and jobs and uh, how these southern kings, these Judean kings, um, were different. Some of them are faithful to uh, the standard David set. Others are bad, but still, even the bad ones um, seem to be compensated for by uh, just that idea of being compared to David. And um, like I said, it's almost a breath of fresh air that we just get to hear the story of David's line. And it does create that connection because it does go all the way back to Adam. So maintaining that line, maintaining that record um, is important with the Chronicles. Uh, and as you continue with the, with the Chronicles, just continue to look for that. How are these kings, um, how are they compared to David? David is always the gold standard. And what is it they do, especially in regard to the temple? And at the end of Chronicles, um, when the people do go into exile, how, does, how has God set it up 
so that uh, God can show his faithfulness about returning the people to the promised land and how do they do how do they respond to this new opportunity uh, that will become kind of a theme for us for the rest of of these um, the readings here uh, when we get to the New Testament we finished up the Gospel of Luke which is our gospel for this year and um, saw the um, that Jesus is not at the grave on uh, the Sunday of, of the resurrection, but is out on the road to Emmaus. And part of this we need to keep in mind is Luke has written a second book about the life of the early church called the Acts of the Apostles. And uh, they are on the road a lot, so maybe that's part of his connection to uh, his second book. So his story, Luke's story, is not quite complete. It's complete for Jesus, but it's not complete for the church. Um, and then we get into the Gospel of John. And John's Gospel is a Gospel that was probably written about 60 years after the uh, death of Christ. And John's had a lot of time to hear people and uh, hear their questions and see how the other Gospels were responded to. So as he writes his Gospel, he's trying to, it seems like he's trying to fill in some of the gaps. And I love how he goes all the way back to the beginning, to the very beginning of creation. And John writes his Gospel from a witness perspective. As someone who was there, um, he writes it in such a way that, um, yeah, there's times it makes you feel like you're there. There's times that it makes you feel like you're hearing the story. People, as they experience Jesus, become stronger um, in their witness. Um, John has a lot of, has what are called the signs, the miracles that show Jesus to be the Son of God. He also has the I am statements. So uh, kind of look as you're reading what happens when these miracles happen, when um, people are, when Jesus says I am, what's the point he's trying to get across? And um, how it is that John tells his story a little differently, how he makes Jesus the Lamb of God, that Paschal Lamb. So um, as you finish up, uh, John, enjoy that. And we're going to basically be done, uh, be just getting into the, the, the Acts of the Apostles. So um, enjoy continuing to uh, hear the story again, but maybe from a little different perspective. Thank you, and we'll talk to you next week. Happy reading.